All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to session five of the AFSOC Heritage Brief. Again, my name is Jim Gilday from the AFSOC History Office. During session five, we're gonna look at the Medal of Honor recipient, John Chapman. We'll look at our 11 Air Force Cross recipients, talk about the rescue of Hammer 3-4, and then we'll end it by honoring our air commandos who pay the ultimate sacrifice who were killed in action. All right, since AFSOC activated in 1990, we have had one Air Commando earn the nation's highest award for extraordinary valor, the Medal of Honor to Master Sergeant John Chapman for action on the 4th of March, 2002. Since AFSOC activated, we have had 11 Air Commandos earn the Air Force's second highest award for extraordinary valor, the Air Force Cross. Kind of a side note, Senior Airman Jason Cunningham, pictured here, he was a pararescueman, but he was never assigned to AFSOC. He was assigned to Air Combat Command, stationed with the 38th Rescue Squadron out of Moody Air Force Base, Georgia. But he volunteered for a deployment with one of our special tactics units to Afghanistan. He was killed on AFSOC's watch. AFSOC has claimed Jason as one of our own ever since, and AFSOC will always claim Jason as one of our own. And then the other living recipients of the Air Force Cross. All right, deep dive to gentlemen. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Okay, let's look at Tech Sergeant John Chapman. He was an AFSOC combat controller attached to an elite Navy SEAL team during Operation Anaconda in Afghanistan on the 4th of March, 2002. This was one of the largest offensives that year. It would claim the lives of seven SOF operators including Jason Cunningham. Their mission was to infill and set up an observation post at the peak of Tucker Gar, an over 10,000 foot mountaintop that overlooked the Shai Cot Valley. This would offer a strategic vantage point as U.S. conventional and coalition forces pushed across that valley floor. Intel suggested they should encounter a light enemy resistance. Intel was wrong. They flew into a hornet's nest of enemy activity. As their chopper approached the landing zone at the top of the mountain, they were immediately engaged by heavy machine gun and small arms fire. Rocket propelled grenades clipped the aircraft's fuselage, spewing hydraulic fluid, causing Navy Petty Officer First Class Neil Roberts to slip and fall, landing approximately 10 feet to the snow-covered ground. The crippled aircraft managed to limp out of the kill zone. The pilot was able to execute a controlled crash landing nearly four miles away. The team was joined by a second chopper. They quickly devised a plan to go back and rescue Neil Roberts. Unbeknownst to them, Neil Roberts had already been executed by Al-Qaeda. Nevertheless, they boarded the second chopper. They returned to the original landing zone this time, the pilot was able to locate a pocket of dead space, shielded from enemy rounds, where he sat down, infilled John Chapman and the SEALs. They immediately began to engage enemy forces. On two separate occasions, John Chapman charged uphill in thigh-deep snow toward enemy fortified bunkers. He killed two insurgents, seized that key terrain, that fortified bunker, on the second assault, he was struck down by an enemy round, presumed dead. The SEAL team was on the verge of being overrun. They were outnumbered and outgunned. Nearly half the team had suffered injuries. SEAL Team Chief Slabinski had no choice but to retrograde his forces down the other side of the mountain, wait for reinforcements to arrive before they could retrieve the bodies of Chapman and Roberts. However, John Chapman wasn't dead. He regained consciousness, wounded, and now alone at the top of the mountain, he sought refuge in that bunker he cleared just minutes prior. Eventually, a quick reaction force chopper appeared on the horizon. Al-Qaeda spotted it. They zeroed in their heavy machine guns and small arms fire and rocket-propelled grenades, intent on blowing that chopper out of the sky as it made its way closer. John Chapman saw the chopper as well. With the grenades and ammunition he had left, he came out and launched a full assault against those emplacements, significantly reducing the threat to that incoming bird. His final act of heroism saved countless lives. 
When we retrieved John's body, he had nine bullet holes in him, a broken nose from the hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was posthumously awarded the nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor, on the 22nd of August, 2018, during a White House ceremony. Again, we have had 11 Air Commandos earn the Air Force Cross. Let's take a look at Staff Sergeant Robert Gutierrez. Again, he's a Joint Terminal Attack Control Qualified Combat Controller attached to an Army Special Forces Unit, an ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha, in Afghanistan. Their mission was to kill or capture a high-value target, a number two Taliban commander. They knew the village, they knew the complex, they knew the house. All they had to do was go in and get him. It would be up to the individual whether he went dead or alive. When they reached the objective, they breached the compound. Bob said it was like hitting a wasp nest. These Taliban commanders are very well protected. His security network converged on them. Bob and his team were drastically outnumbered and outgunned. Bob was shot in the upper shoulder, left a golf ball size hole in his back, bleeding profusely. Now Bob is trained in combat first aid. He knew with his type of injury his unlucky number was three. He knew in three minutes he would be dead. He would bleed out and be dead. We asked Bob, what was going through your mind when you thought you had three minutes and you'd be dead? Bob said, I thought I had three minutes to live. I need to change the world in three minutes. He meant his team's world from being overrun and killed to staying alive. Now Bob had A-10s overhead waiting to be called in. He got on the radio, coughed up blood, couldn't speak. That round wreaked havoc on his entire chest, caused a collapsed lung, caused air to fill his pleural cavity, a condition my med folks will tell you is known as a tension pneumothorax. Not only was he bleeding to death, now he was essentially suffocating to death as well. If Bob was going to change the world in three minutes, he was quickly approaching death's door. When he was touched by the hand of a guardian angel, who happened to be in the form of an 18 Delta, known as the team medic. Quickly stopped the bleeding, took out a syringe, plunged it into his chest to relieve the pressure. Now Bob could breathe. Now Bob could speak. He quickly got on the radio, called in his A-10s. Now I was told danger close for an A-10, or a 30 millimeter round from an A-10. It's about 65 meters. So you don't want the round coming any closer than that because it could potentially cause injury or death. The enemy was so close to Bob's team, he had no choice but to call in two strafing runs 20 meters from his position. Kill the enemy, not a scratch on Bob's team. Again, that is the true testament between the skill of that pilot and that ground controller. Incidentally, at the Air Force Cross ceremony here at Herbert, the medic who saved Bob's life that enabled Bob to save the team's life was also at the ceremony. And again, our other living recipients, all similar acts of heroism. Okay, so making history is usually done at the lowest levels, but you never actually think you're making history, right? You're just doing your job. As was the case in 1999 with a young lieutenant assigned to the 20th SOS here at Hurlburt during the rescue of Hammer 3-4, a downed Lieutenant Colonel F-16 pilot in the Balkans who was minutes before being captured by Serbian forces and would have been surely killed. That lieutenant was the former commander of the 1 SAO, Colonel Tom Polensky, and that F-16 Lieutenant Colonel pilot is General David Goldfein, our Chief of Staff. Every anniversary on that day, General Goldfein personally delivers a bottle of Glenfiddich Scotch whiskey to the 23rd Special Operations, excuse me, 23rd Special Tactics Squadron here at Hurlburt Field because three of their operators were the ones that actually saved his life and snatched him off the ground. Now again, he would visit the 23rd STS, no, pu no public affairs, no protocol, just a private moment between the chief and the squadron. I was told they would take out the old bottle from the display case, put in the new bottle, they would crack it open, have a shot with the squadron commander, and then go out and do memorial push-ups with the squadron teammates. Okay, now this is a short summary video of kind of everything we talked about during these five sessions. Born out of necessity, 
forged in training, cemented on the battlefield, Air Commandos. Air Force Special Operations Command was established in 1990, but Special Operations Aviation dates back to World War II. General Hap Arnold directed veteran fighter pilots Lieutenant Colonels Philip Cochran and John Allison to build a self-reliant composite fighting force to support British Brigadier General Ord Wingate and his chin dits. Now, nothing you've ever done before in your life means a thing. Tonight, you're gonna find out you've got a soul. Good luck. In March 1944, this force was designated the First Air Commando Group. From these missions, the First Air Commando Group earned its motto, any place, any time, anywhere, a variation that is still used today. Early in the Korean War, U.S. Army Intelligence and the CIA needed to deploy intelligence teams and supplies through short and long-range low-level penetration into North and South Korea. Special operations provided these unconventional warfare and counterinsurgency operations and the ability to recover downed airmen during these covert missions. The 4400th Combat Crew Training Squadron deployed a detachment to Bien Hoa, Republic of Vietnam on Operation Farmgate. Their mission was to train the Vietnamese Air Force. Thus, Air Force Special Operations Forces flew some of the first U.S. combat missions in Vietnam. The Air Force introduced the first gunships into combat with the deployment of AC-47s to Vietnam. It is guided by North Vietnam and it is spurred by Communist China. Its goal is to conquer the South, to defeat American power, and to extend the Asiatic dominion of communism. And there are great stakes in the balance. Air Force Special Operations Forces deployed in Vietnam reached a total of 10,000 people, 550 aircraft, and 19 squadrons. One of the most notable missions supported by the U.S. Air Force Special Operations was the Son Tai POW Camp Raid in 1970. This raid altered how the North Vietnamese housed, treated, and interacted with the foreign prisoners. President Jimmy Carter ordered an attempt to end the Iran hostage crisis. The operation encountered many obstacles and was eventually aborted. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages who've been held captive there since November 4th. The equipment failure in the rescue helicopters made it necessary to end the mission. Immediately following the failed Eagle Claw operation, the Pentagon planned a second mission to rescue the hostages in Iran. The concept was to modify a C-130 Hercules with rocket packages to allow for landing and taking off in the confined space of Amjadai Stadium, Iran. The mission was terminated after the Iranian parliament agreed to release the hostages. Grenada, we were told, was a friendly island paradise for tourism. Well, it wasn't. It was a Soviet Cuban colony being readied as a major military bastion to export terror and undermine democracy. We got there just in time. The 23rd Air Force participated in the successful rescue of Americans from the island nation of Grenada. As president, I have no higher obligation and to safeguard the lives of American citizens. And that is why I directed our armed forces to protect the lives of American citizens in Panama and to bring General Noriega to justice in the United States. The 23rd Air Force participated in the reestablishment of democracy in the Republic of Panama during Operation Just Cause. Special Tactics Combat Controllers and Pararescuemen provided important support to combat units during this operation. A first Special Operations Wing Combat Talon Crew 
ferried the captured Panamanian president, Manuel Noriega, to prison in the United States. On the 22nd of May, 1990, General Larry D. Welch, Air Force Chief of Staff, designated 23rd Air Force as Air Force Special Operations Command. Announcement is made that Headquarters 23rd Air Force, Crawford Field, Florida, is redesignated Headquarters Air Force Special Operations Command. In the life of a nation, we're called upon to define who we are and what we believe. Sometimes these choices are not easy. But today, as president, I ask for your support in a decision I've made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. AFSOC participated in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, the protection of Saudi Arabia and liberation of Kuwait. Special Operations Forces perform direct action missions, infiltration, exfiltration, combat search and rescue. Pavlo crews led the helicopter assault on radars to blind Iraq at the onset of hostilities. AFSOC's special tactics and intelligence personnel supported Operation Restore Hope in Somalia to establish a secure environment for humanitarian operations. AFSOC maintained a constant combat search and rescue alert posture as part of Operation Joint Guard. Our mission is clear, to demonstrate the seriousness of NATO's purpose so that the Serbian leaders understand the imperative of reversing course, to deter an even bloodier offensive against innocent civilians in Kosovo, and if necessary, to seriously damage the Serbian military's capacity to harm the people of Kosovo. In short, if President Milosevic will not make peace, we will limit his ability to make war. Tonight, we are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. Our grief has turned to anger and anger to resolution. Whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. AFSOC deployed forces to Southwest Asia for Operation Enduring Freedom to help confront and remove the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, along with the Taliban-supported Al-Qaeda terrorist organization headed by Osama bin Laden, who were responsible for the September 11th attacks on the United States. All the time there's jets, uh, sound of jets flying around, and the Taliban, they don't care about it. But there's one, one plane that, that uh, scares them. There was a the sound of this transport plane that scared them. And this is a plane equipped with a lot of um, heavy machine guns, even a cannon. And the thing is, the Taliban, they know that this, this gunship is used when there is some special forces operations. It's used as a support, air support, during these kind of operations. AFSOC again deployed forces to Southwest Asia this time in support of what would become Operation Iraqi Freedom, which removed Saddam Hussein and liberated the Iraqi people from his ruthless Ba'athist regime. Special operations had brought their unique abilities for humanitarian aid around the world, to such places as the Indian Ocean Tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, Haiti, and the Japanese earthquake and tsunami. For the last three decades, if there has been a fight, a contingency, or a humanitarian mission, AFSOC has been in the thick of it. Air Force Special Operations Command. Okay, on the battlefield, when you hear the term fallen angel, that means a U.S. force is down. Any responding forces will lend assistance. Since AFSOC activated in 1990, we, have 30, we had 35 air commandos pay the ultimate sacrifice who were killed in action. Again, these are strictly, strictly the air, air commandos who were killed in action. doesn't involve our air commandos who were killed during training. As we always do in AFSOC, we always remember our fallen, so we'll remember our 35 fallen here.
Okay, so this, is, this was our journey. We looked at the Medal of Honor, the Air Force Cross, the rescue of Hammer 3-4, and we ended with the ultimate sacrifice of our Air Commandos. Again, if you have any questions, please email, email me at james.gilday at us.af.mil. Once again, thanks for your attention.